Marilyn Nicholas earned her bachelor's degree in education and psychology from Regis College in 1959. Dr. Nicholas taught in public education for eight years. She came to Towson State College in 1967 and has served as a faculty member and administrator for over 40 years. These are her reflections. Dr. Nicholas, thank you for sharing your thoughts about your teacher preparation and your subsequent career in education. Um, we are hoping that your story will add to our understanding of the evolution of teacher education at Towson University. To start with, we would love for you to share with us your early social context, where you grew up, um, what you thought about career choices, and when you first considered becoming a teacher. Okay, thank you for including me in this project. I'm really excited to be part of it and look forward to sharing my teaching career with you and anyone else who's going to look at it. <laughs> um, well, I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, and I was an only child. My father was a pharmacist. My mother was... Um, an administrative assistant, um, but I don't think they called him that, to uh, the bank president. So, and um, I grew up at 35 Capitol Street. I used to go to my grandparents' home, and my grandfather would take me to preschool, or I don't know if they called it preschool in those days, but I would go to the Pomeroy house and have an activity and then my uncle would come, my grandfather would come and pick me up and take me back to Murphy Court where I would stay until my mom was finished working and she would come and take me home. So they spoke Italian. I never, I could, I understood the, I heard the language but I never spoke Italian to them. But I remember playing an Italian card game with my grandfather called Scopa and I used to try to cheat so I'd win. <laughs> but, um, so when it was time to go to school, right down the street from 35 Capitol Street was a French school. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the French school from kindergarten to eighth grade, and then I transferred to Our Lady School. And what was interesting about the French school was that I was taught French in the morning and English in the afternoon one year and then it was reversed the next year. So I learned all my subjects in French and then learned them all again in English in the afternoon. And I really remember in kindergarten I was a left-hand writer and I remember um, the nun tying my hand behind my back really? because that I wasn't supposed to write left-handed, I was supposed to write right-handed. So that's what they did. So when, now when I... Did that happen? In kindergarten. Oh, in kindergarten. Wow. <clears throat> So now I write with my right hand, but I eat with my left hand. Uh -huh. And the other night, um, friends of mine took me bowling, and I was very conscious of bowling with my left hand. So it's kind of interesting it how that interesting. occurs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> then we, we moved from Capitol Street to 635 Center Street, where I lived through high school and college. And I remember distinctly uh, saying to my mother I wanted to go to Regis College because it was a Catholic college and the nuns had ingrained in you that, you know, you really should have Catholic education. Uh -huh. And my mother said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'll probably think about being a teacher. And she said, well, I think we should go to Framingham State. Hmm. And, and why did she... Because that was a um, teacher, much like Towson, Univer Towson University, uh -huh. it was like Framingham right. Normal's teacher prep, and that's what they excelled in, and uh -huh. it was a premier institution in the Boston area. So we went and I had an... My, I don't know how I had an interview with the president, and he asked, um, what did I want to do? And I said, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. And he said, um, that, you know, he talked about the program, and he said, well, do you want to come to Framingham? And I said, no, I really want to go to Regis College. And my mother kicked me <laughs> under the table, I remember that. And um, he said to my mother, then if she really wants to go to Regis, that's where you should send her. Mm. So I went to Regis College, and um, I, 
I believe tuition and room and board was $500. Wow. Yeah, it's not that now. I'm sure. And so um, my major there was um, psychology with an education minor. And you couldn't major in education? No, they did not. Ha it was a liberal arts college. Uh -huh. And my biggest trauma was we had to pass two years of gym. <laughs> And we had two days of comps in psychology. Wow. And if you didn't pass your comps, you didn't graduate. Mm. And we, um, when, you got to, when you were a senior, and if you were in good academic standing, you got to wear your academic robe for, yeah. well, f for major events. Really? Um, well, going to, if you went to, going to the, uh, Matt going to Mass uh -huh. and going to beginning of the school year, they always uh -huh. had a big event. And any other kind of event, seniors were allowed to wear their academic robe to d distinguish them for the rest of the undergraduates. And one of the neat things, too, at Regis, we had um, freshmen, junior, junior sisters, uh -huh. freshmen, junior sisters, uh -huh. and senior sisters. And now that I've been out of Re Regis for such a long time, I'm on the alumni board and my senior sister is on the trust board of trustees so we get to see each other <laughs> at wonderful. during occasions yeah and so. have you stayed in touch over time not really um and certain occasions uh -huh. like um reunions of because course. she'd be there with on the same reunion right. year and um that's just it was just very interesting at the end of your <clears throat> undergraduate work how did you feel about becoming a teacher well that was very interesting, um, our preparation for teaching at Regis. Um, I don't know how I, I was assigned to a, a Catholic school in West Roxbury, and I, I'm, try, I, I'm trying to think. No, West Roxbury was very high end, very upper middle class, but I remember teaching in first grade, and there were 50 children in the room, all in rows. And when the supervisor, supervising teacher came in from Regis, she sat at the desk in front and watched me teach. And we student taught one day a week. So of course there was no long range planning, um, no idea of developing a unit, I mean it was, this is what you will teach on Thursdays next week. So hmm. the continuity was missing for me. Right. And also classroom management. I had no clue about how to do classroom management when I began teaching because in a Catholic school you really didn't have many problems with the children. They all sat in rows, they all behaved because the nun was there in a black robe. Uh -huh. So they certainly weren't, weren't acting out. <laughs> and I remembered one, one activity I remember doing she wanted me to do a fruit bowl at Thanksgiving, but the nun t showed me how to fold the paper and how to do it so that every fruit bowl would look alike. There was no having creativity for right. children or saying, okay, if we're having a fruit bowl, how would you, let's talk about what a fruit bowl is. What do you know about a fruit bowl? What would you put in it? Uh -huh. And not no stimulation it was just okay we're going to put the oranges the apples <laughs> the grapes and this is what how it's going to look like so um creativity was not part of my early training interesting yeah it's very interesting um so when you graduated did you immediately go into a teaching position i did um we had very dear friends of the family uh, bill de stefano he lived in towson maryland and but was a principal, I was a principal at the time, and his brother Richard lived here, and he um, was a coach and taught at Delaney. And the interesting thing, he was also a member of the um, Colts marching band. He played the Glockenspiel. So I, my early introduction to Colt football was because of Bill <laughs> DeStefano. Uh, so I remember applying probably my er, second semester of my senior year and <clears throat> I, 
I, I, I flew to Baltimore and I was interviewed. And I was hired on the spot. This was Baltimore County. This was Baltimore County. Mm -hmm. And I was hired on the spot. So I went home. I can remember I had a red cashmere coat. I thought I remember. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember much about the interview. The interview was why do you want to teach? Um, what grade would you like to teach? Um, and so, um, I, and I didn't really want to teach and build a Stefano school because I knew him, but that's where they placed me. And so I graduated and um, I, can I drove down with a car and I boarded with um, a young woman who lived, who worked at the same school, but we lived in Lake, Lake, on Lake Avenue. So I rented a room from then and I taught there for two years. But um, the drive to go from Lake Avenue to Sussex Elementary School in Essex was almost two hours daily. So I think we would leave the house at six, six o'clock just to get there because there was no beltway. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just a very interesting experience because I had no clue about the children, the environment, um, being brought up in a middle class family. That was, the, the socioeconomic area was entirely different from what I had ever observed. Uh -huh. and, the, and just being in Baltimore was so different. And so I think my first assignment, and we taught first grade, they did not have kindergarten at that time. Right. So for the first month, first graders only came to school, I believe, a half a day. Mm -hmm. I'm, I may be wrong, maybe it was a couple of weeks, I may be wrong at that, but I know it was a significant part of time that they only came a half a day to get used to the full day of school. But they put me as a beginning teacher on as to get an idea of the environment. They put me on the bus and I had to take the children who were bus students home. <laughs> well, at the end of that period, we got back to the school and there was a child on the bus and I didn't know, I was in tears because I had no clue where he belonged. Oh my heavens. So, um, we finally figured it out. He just didn't want to get off the bus. He just wanted to take a ride for the day. I see. So we did that. <laughs> that was one experience. Um, I can remember my first observation as a beginning teacher. Um, but one of the things that I, since I was clueless as, as to how to plan mm -hmm. and how to use the handbooks and how to use curriculum guides, I was very smart in going across the hall to an older teacher who happened to have been um, a former nun, sat down with her and said, what do we do tomorrow? And I did that every day for the two years I was at Sussex Elementary School because I needed to understand the content, I needed to understand what, how to teach, how to do classroom management, what was going on. So that was part of my... And what happened next? You said two years. Um, so my first observation, they sat in the back of the room and they told me that I needed to improve my handwriting. Well, I, I think I was blown away at that point because there was more that I needed to improve. <laughs> it was just not my handwriting on the blackboard. It was really how to do, how, how to, how, learning strategies. I had really no clue. I was just teaching rope. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so I think it was my mentoring, my going across all Gloria Evangelisti was across the hall from me. And huh. she, at one point when I was in the case office, when I arrived at Towson, she, I hired her to teach here. So, um, so she was a mentor. She was a mentor. Sorts. She was a mentor Not to me also. No, but, but I'd go across the hall and watch her teach because she was very creative. And she had had two more years' experience uh -huh. prior to, she had more experience than I did. So I taught with all of those individuals, even Nancy Grasmick was teaching at that time around there. So I was part of all that early Baltimore County trend, but I never stayed there. I decided I missed Boston too much, so then I went back home and then returned. 
So but did you teach up there as well? I did, I and did. And did you teach in a Catholic school no, again? No, no, I had two wonderful experiences. I taught at Dedham, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. at the Green Lodge School, and that superintendent had just completed his degree from Boston University, and it was in team learning. And uh, the Green Lodge School was a brand new school at that time, and I was teaching first grade, and we would have lots of visitors, and you'd hear on the PA system, we were having visitors ask this afternoon, team learning will be in operation. <laughs> so, uh, and you were forewarned. We were forewarned, but te te teaching first grade, we were not part of that. It was four, fifth, fourth, fifth, and sixth, but we sort of did little things. Um, that was a very interesting experience at the Green Lodge School. I never could find the film strips. I never could find some of the uh, construction paper. The principal decided she was going to hoard all that, and I guess pass it on to the next principal so she could get a big award. But um, when I left the Green Lodge School, I transferred to uh, Lexington, Massachusetts, and I was in the first team teaching school with Harvard. Harvard Lexington had a partnership. Oh. So that was the first early beginnings of team teaching. Mm. And they built a school. This was a very old two-floor school, mm -hmm. but this is where they developed the team teaching. And the, and the reason being, if it could happen in a senior building, uh -huh. then let's develop a new building that can accommodate what we're talking about is te having teachers team together. So I taught there for um, three years. And um, if you remember Joan and David Shoes? Vaguely. Okay, well, uh, Joan was a school psychologist in the town of Lexington. And one of the neat things that happened in our team teaching school was every Wednesday afternoon we had planning time mm -hmm. and we would meet with school psychologists, counselors on how to handle various students, disruptive students, helping us cope with um, understanding the teaching process. But we had team meetings on those days. So it was really, yeah, it was a wonderful, that, I think, was the highlight of my career. And it also provided you the opportunity to go in and look at senior teachers who were mm. teaching so you could gain those strategies. Right. So I taught, um, I taught the high level reading and the low math and for one year and then I, they reversed it, you know, so that you didn't always right. get to teach the same thing. But we had 200 children, seven teachers, and we were always, and team leader, assistant team leader, and we were all responsible for meeting together, planning the curriculum, and assessing the students. So um, I taught there, and that was very. Um, I was married and taught there. I married and taught there for two years, and when I was leaving to move back to Baltimore, I remember being very sad, and I would not. I did not want to meet the person who was taking my place. Uh -huh. uh, that was very hard um, for me to leave Lexington because it was such a wonderful experience, and. Um, yeah, it was a great experience. So, you know, in my career, having that partnership with Harvard, we also were given wonderful professional development mm -hmm. from Harvard mm -hmm. and to the Lexington, town of Lexington. So it was just great. So, I mean, when they talk about partnerships, we were doing it early on. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah, so what goes around comes around Should as we? always, right? Uh -huh. Different kinds of partnerships. and. I, I did get my master's degree from Boston University, and we had student teachers, and the town of Lexington would give you a voucher, uh -huh. and so you could you would get, if you had a student teacher, they, they collected all the vouchers, and if you were taking courses at Boston University or Harvard, you would get a voucher, and that would allow you to have a free course. Wow. So they, you know, they, just because the student, student teacher was assigned to one school didn't mean those teachers would get it. it was anyone in the town of Lexington if they had enough vouchers for BU or for Harvard or whatever. So mm -hmm. that was kind of that was an interesting concept oh, also. Right, and a good partnership. Very good partnership. 
So you moved back to Baltimore. I moved back to Baltimore, and I remember going, I remember saying, oh, I can get a job. I'm not, uh, since we're going to Baltimore, I can get a job there. That won't be any problem. So I called Baltimore County, and I was interviewed, and I was rehired, and I was taught at Hampton Elementary School. Uh -huh. And I taught first grade there. And that's where I met Mary Taylor. Mm -hmm. Mary Taylor may have had student teachers there. Mm -hmm. And she walked into my room and I had a speech to print phonics box, which was developed by Donald Durrell from Boston University, whom I'd studied under. And so she said to me, what are you doing here? You should be at Towson College. Was it Towson College? It was called at that time. It wasn't Towson University. Towson, Towson State, State College. So I said, okay. And I had met George Diffender, for he lived across the street from Bill DiStefano. And I remember meeting George Diffender, for he taught in the geography department here at one time. Mm -hmm. And I, in the back of my mind, thought at one point, you know, I really would like to teach at Towson. That would be a goal I'd like to teach at a college or university. Now, I had no clue how I was going to get there. But I guess putting it out there, right. somehow Mary came into my classroom. And she, she, was being, she was being transferred to the project that Billy Hauserman, Mary Taylor, Jack Epstein, Manny Velder worked in Baltimore City in conjunction with Morgan. It was a partnership, and I and I have to. I, I hope I can think of the name of the project, but it was a special project that we had developing urban teachers. Mm. And when would that have been? Would that, was that in? The Had to be early 60s. I was going to say. Early 60s. 64, is, 65, 66, 67. In, in, in that, because I'm trying to think. I'm just thinking that developing urban teachers, that was a fairly progressive idea. Mid, right, and mid it was. 60s. Right, it was. Billy, Billy Hauserman was in charge of it. Project Mission, that's what it was, uh -huh. Project Mission. And Mary, of course, was assigned to that for the literacy component. Uh -huh. Manny Velder was a teacher in Baltimore City, but then became a part, you know, was a partnership there. So then he eventually transferred to Towson. So I was, so I was interviewed and I became a visiting guest lecturer, a visiting professor or something like that. And that's how I began. Um, I remember going over when we had um, we had cohorts and we had groups of students, like elementary, I think believe still does. I remember going over to um, Eileen Cohn's home, sitting outside, and I was very nervous about teaching language arts, reading, social studies, to. It, as a core curriculum to the students. She just looked at me and said, oh, you're going to be wonderful. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't know anything about this. What about the books? What about the text? How do you do a course syllabus? And so, um, and I, she was already there in that capacity. She was already here teaching. I and see. so I sort of hooked on to her uh -huh. as my mentor. Uh -huh. um, anyway, it worked out, and I'm still here. <laughs> yes. So. Um, Marilyn, you've been here in a variety of capacities. I, you have been um, a professor in elementary education. You are now a professor in instructional leadership and professional development. In between those two, you have been um, director of the Center for Applied Skills in Education, which in essence is the office that deals with student teaching and school placements and that. You have worked with, which at its time was a new program, the Master of Arts in Teaching program, which is initial cert, but mm -hmm. at the graduate level. Um, what am I forgetting here? Lots of things. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about 
some of those positions and how that sort of has influenced your thinking on how we best educate, prepare teachers? I guess thinking back on my own experience, I knew it was trial by fire. Yeah. And I knew the, the prob I, I had direct experience in the problems of being successful as a teacher. I think for me, what helped in the long run was the psychology major. Mm -hmm. That foundation geared me into understanding human growth and development in children and then being able to apply the content. It was the content that I was missing, the teaching strategies, um, how do you best involve students, it, those kinds of things I was weak in so that my counterparts coming from a traditional education major were much more successful in the application. But I think I had a lo better view of the process and could see the whole picture rather than just the little pieces that went up to make the whole picture. So I struggled with that mm -hmm. a long time. So when I arrived at Towson, I knew that I wanted to learn the strategy. So I probably was learning along with the students at the same time, which is probably an, an interesting fact, fact that I wanted to be creative uh -huh. and I wanted to induce creativity and include art, music, and PE into the program, even though those were, PE was never my, never my strength. Um, so taking all of those strategies and l listening to that, I began to develop my own way of teaching. And it wasn't a lecture style method, but it was more, okay, we're going to, we're going to talk about cooperative learning, I was actually going to model it and demonstrate it and then have them model it. So I became more of a facilitator and that's my has been my teaching style all through my career. It's not the lecture mode, it's more application. How do we do it? Let's see how we can do it. How it, can we improve it? And I was a great proponent of micro teaching. I think having teachers teach each other and reflect on what they're doing and model it and rethink it through was much was a great success for me, and I think one of the one of the highlights for me um, when Evelyn de Tosto and um, all our good friends were at the State Department was Evelyn, um, Joyce Murphy, um, they noticed when they would come to review our programs that faculty had little professional development except when attending conferences. Mm -hmm. And they brought in Madeline Hunter, and I can remember going to a number of retreats with Madeline Hunter and actually doing that same teaching style. We were taught and then we did micro-teaching among ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that to me, was just the basis of how I grew as a professional and how I could talk about teaching strategies, what would be a good way if you have this kind of a student, what do we need to do to help move that student. So it was individualizing the instruction. And, and just being with a variety of professionals that were on my level, mm -hmm. we were all the same because we were all students and we were all learning. And it was a wonderful experience. And I think faculty today don't have that. I think we're missing that, that key of professional development and training. They're, more, they're really concerned about research and how to be successful in their own careers. Not that they're not good teachers in the classroom, right. but I think that missing, the, the link is missing that we had once before. So that's... Um, my career in, um, I think I was bored after a while. We developed, well, we developed the student, we had those um, groups. I forgot what, I've forgotten what we used to call them, but maybe um, it'll come back to me. Then we developed the teaching centers. Mm -hmm. And I remember Maude Broyles and all the early faculty they wanted to go to Howard County, but of course they didn't want to drive the Beltway. So I was the young, 
professional. I was probably the youngest in the department. Okay, let's send Marilyn there. We'll send Marilyn to Howard County, and she can open up the first teach student teaching center. And we did at Faulkner Ridge Elementary School. And what was the thinking behind having a student teaching center? We, we really took that from University of Maryland. University of Maryland had started to develop that. And the stu student teaching center was where we would take a group of students and we would integrate language arts, reading, social studies, and teach the curriculum in the school mm -hmm. and invite teachers in to talk about language arts, reading, and social studies, in, in, really integrating theory and practice. Uh -huh. Um, and we would have them in the, in the school for the whole student teaching experience. So you'd be 14. In fact, you were at Faulkner Ridge Elementary School. So <laughs> you went through. Indeed. So you know, we were in an open space school, brand new. Um, and I was talking about this last night, how first two years of Faulkner Ridge Elementary School, those teachers thought they were in heaven. And then <laughs> when um, Interface Housing opened and we had other students, students from the urban areas come into um, Howard County, those teachers were shocked and had no idea of how to cope with it. And so um, that was a learning experience, not only for my students, but also for the teachers. And it, it was a great experience being at, um, in an open space school, and we paired that with open space, and then we had the traditional school down the street. So you spent seven weeks in an open space and seven weeks in a traditional and you learn to language arts reading and social studies and you know for me that was the forerunner of the professional development mm -hmm. school um, it certainly sounds like it had many of those components right and then some of my faculty and i used to integrate the language arts reading and social studies in my student teaching centers but then um some people wanted to front load it and just do student teaching, you know, so they would front load the language arts reading and social studies and, you know, whatever, change the model to suit their needs. But we were out in the schools almost five days a week except mm -hmm. for Monday. So um, that was, you know, working with 14 student teachers. I, I, I don't think faculty who teach in the liberal arts component understand what it's like to be out in the field and to work conjunctively with just 14, it, it's sometimes a little more difficult. It look, especially when you have one student that really needs mentoring the whole 14 weeks mm -hmm. and what happens if they're not going to be successful. And we did micro teaching, we videotaped, we, they looked at their own teaching and experiences. So we did lots of wonderful things in those early days. Let's see, where did I move to next? I, well, did, I did that for a long time. One of the things that I did want you to talk about was you oversaw the Masters in the Art, uh, Master of Arts in Teaching program, and that was a new concept, which was you, the idea of taking people who had a bachelor's degree in some content area and then did the master's degree for, uh, to, um, cover all the initial certification requirements to become a teacher in Maryland. Um, tell us a little bit about that and your that, thinking on that program. That was developed as an urban program, almost like Project Mission. Mm. So when I was the assistant director and then became the director of the MAT program, that was only housed in Baltimore City. Interesting. Um, and I truly believe that that's where it probably, uh, my commitment was that we needed to develop urban teachers. And it was, very, we were very straightforward about that, that if you wanted to become an, come into the MAT program, you had to do your teaching and placements in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. That didn't mean you had to teach there at the end, right. but it was an opportunity for us to develop a cadre of teachers that would re would want to be urban teachers and would strengthen that base because heretofore Baltimore City had a lot of transient teachers. Teachers would go if they couldn't get a job, they'd go to Baltimore City, stay two years, and then, you know, as a third year, transfer to the other counties um, because the feeling was, well, if you could teach in Baltimore City, you could teach anywhere. But I 
kind of wa I wanted, I felt we should develop a strong base there. Um, and then uh, it, other people decided that, oh, this was such a good program, we could take it other places, other places as an expand it and make it larger, and we, learn, learn, we lo lost the focus of the MAT. But one of the neat things I think we did, um, we would bring all the potential candidates in and interview them on one day because we only took in 20, the mm -hmm. co or 20, so it was a very select group. It wasn't anyone who came off the street that said they wanted to be a teacher. It was a select group of individuals, and we brought back uh, the faculty, but there were other MAT students, and they, we would sit down and we would pick out the 20, and we really relied heavily on the former MAT students because having been through the program, they understood the rigor. Mm -hmm. Because they, the first, you know, the, 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 they would come in in the summer and do nine hours, and it would be very rigorous. So they understood the rigor that if you had a family and you had other commitments, maybe this wasn't the program right. for you. So then that, that portion was disbanded, the interview process, the urban process was disbanded, and it's now um, an MAT program to train teachers to be professionals, very similar to others across the nation. Mm -hmm. Then I went, I guess I went to, the, well, I, before that I went to the case office. Mm -hmm. I followed Jim Binko and Chandler and <laughs> um, Jim Lawler. Right. They all left and I, for a long time, was the only person in the case office. Wow. Um, <clears throat> we did all the placements um, and I, when I was in the case office, I always tried to have that connection with Baltimore City, mm -hmm. and I always wanted to make sure that we had teachers in Baltimore City. We, and because certification requires you to do that, so I would always make sure that I had good schools in Baltimore City and have maintained a nice relationship with Baltimore City. And I, 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 and Harford County, we went, explored Harford County. So we had, we had um, Howard County, Baltimore County, Harford County, Baltimore City, Carroll County. I remember taking a best alt worker to Carroll County so she could be a, um, a coordinator out there. Um, so that the reach of the um, par partnerships was growing. Yes, for the student teaching centers, uh -huh. yes. That was very much part of it. And then, remember, we were mandated to have an um, special ed, and we had to do the field placements for special ed. Which that, is much tougher. That, yeah, because they had to find three, you know, go out three days a week, and I mean, that was a nightmare to get all those partnerships mm -hmm. in and to make all those placements for all programs. Our, you know, K-12 right, programs, early childhood, elementary, secondary. I mean, the case office did a lot of work. I wasn't saddled with a lot of the testing as the case office may now have, mm -hmm. because we didn't have to. There was no praxis. <clears throat> no, there was, the praxis was there, but oh. we didn't have to worry about gathering data, I mean, at I that see. point for accrediting. Right, um, which of course now <clears throat> is fundamental. Right, they, they, they're gathering data all the time for the impact of how are our teachers impacting the students, but that impact wasn't there. We used to do a lot of teacher training, bring the teachers in. Uh -huh. And I remember when the state developed the Maryland Competency Observation Instrument that at one point, you remember, we were trained, they gathered a group of us to be trained. They were going to send out a group of us to observe initial teachers who were beginning teachers mm -hmm. because they were, not, they were going to delay certification, delay that, and we were going out to observe them that first year and if they needed to have additional support that was given to them. So, but then they found out what the cost would be to do that. And so they offered this instrument, the Maryland Competency Observation Instrument, to the colleges and universities to use as an observation tool for student teachers, teachers, and, stu and um, 
university supervisors so that the three of us could sit down and use this one instrument. Mm -hmm. So I developed a ta training process for our university supervisors as well as the supervising teachers and brought them together to do that kind of training to impact the observation skill of the supervising teacher and, it, and develop that partnership so that they would think of themselves more of a teacher educator. So that That's was another part of that process. Right. And part of the team. Because teachers think of themselves as a teacher of children, but they don't have that larger picture. I'm a teacher educator. Right. And I'm training. And and, and I think with the student teaching centers that was something that we tried to bring them in to teach. Okay, why don't you do a demonstration on a particular skill for reading language arts or social studies or science or what you're doing and then have then debrief with his teachers. So so there was some of that that went on, but mm -hmm. to try to give that background to, to the teacher so that they would be think of themselves as a teacher educator. That was fun. Did that, then went to the MAT. And then <clears throat> after the MAT program, um um the dean asked me if I would do Teachers for Tomorrow. Tell us a little bit about that program. <clears throat> that, that was not an initial CERT program. No, no. Teachers for Tomorrow was, a, again, a partnership. Um, and, and it was University of Maryland, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Coppin, and Towson. My role I'm trying to think who was the dean at that. Um, was that Dennis Hinkle? Dennis Hinkle. Dennis gave me, that was my job. Mm -hmm. I was responsible for the Teachers for Tomorrow. So I was part of the team that developed the curriculum, um, gathered the students, but it, and the t it was for Baltimore City. We recruited certified teachers. Mm -hmm and they were given a master's degree if they committed to teaching five years, and they did not pay a penny. Now, Dennis really wanted them, the second or third year, to have some stake in it and wanted to charge them $100, which I think you know we should have, uh -huh. because that might have kept it going. But it eventually all came to Towson because I was the only one committed to keeping it moving. Uh -huh. And we had probably 11 cohorts. And, those and how many students would you have in a cohort? 12, 15? It depended if we could. Re we, how I did it, I would always tell the, the teachers, OK, you have to replace yourself. So <laughs> they would, the, and they were the best ones to find someone who would really be committed to staying in Baltimore City because they wanted the goal was to be, develop administrators and to stop that ebb and flow from teacher transitioning, staying there two years, leaving, coming in, leaving. Um, it was to attract good teachers who would be willing to stay to become administrators to really turn Baltimore City around. And I can tell you that I'm still in contact with several of them. Corey Basmasian right now graduated from um, Teachers for Tomorrow with an Ed Leadership degree, and he's now at Boston University in the New Leaders Program, and then will come back to Baltimore City and be a principal. Um, I have several principals, several team leaders. Don Shirey was in the first cohort, and she was at Montebello. Then she became a team leader, then she became an AP, then she became a principal at Commodore Jones. John, John Commodore Jones Elementary School in Baltimore City, and now she's on the administrative team in Baltimore City, where she goes around to schools that are failing and to help get them back on track. And she's also taught in the ILPD department curriculum supervision, as because I brought her on as a teacher from Baltimore City who would be able to talk about programming and curriculum and she had so much experience at, for future administrators. So that program served its need mm -hmm, and I indeed. think had, and, and 
has stronger is stronger than Teach for America because for the most part Teach for America they come in for two years and then they'll leave uh -huh. but and I did have a couple of Teach for America students in my in the cohorts and they said you know we didn't learn anything and we learned but we didn't have the support so uh -huh. they would come back for their traditional MED so interesting yeah so it, at one point I had and you know I'd have uh, teachers for tomorrow in the reading program, mm -hmm. a large number in the reading program, early childhood, elementary, not too many in secondary. And then when ed leadership took on, then it was so hard to have five programs I would just concentrate with reading and ed leadership. Uh -huh. um, because my feeling is if you are already in, have a degree with elementary and early childhood, you need to widen your range right. and understand the entire spectrum of the school, especially if you want to be an administrator. Indeed. I mean, you know, get into the reading, develop your reading skills or math or whatever. So, One, one last thing in terms of your professional um, development and career that I would love for you to talk about a little bit is you have been very much at the forefront on um, converting things and developing programs that are delivered online. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> just love to hear some thoughts about what you've been up to and what kind of role you think online courses should play in in-service or pre-service teacher prep? Well, that I became interested in online. Um, I don't know, many people don't know this, but I'm, um, um, I've worked with the Distance Education Training Council, and it's not an accrediting agency, but it does offer a stamp to programs. So I became interested in online through two avenues. Um, I, I, was an, uh, I was a review person for the American Council on Education with the MIVA project. Um, I went to military installations and we reviewed academic programs that were taught on base. So um, to make sure that the universities were using the same content and doing and, mm -hmm. and, and not um, serving the military well. So, so from MIVR and DETC, I had the opportunity to, to meet people that were doing online work and then seeing what online was like. Um, and, um, and, and getting involved in distance education. So I was one of the first faculty that developed this human growth. I, it was um, Uh, it was, um, I'm trying to think of my course that I taught online first, the distance ed course. It was the, like the human relations course, but we changed the name of it to leadership and group dynamics. And so we, um, ATE had a um, classroom downstairs in the Cook Library for distance education. Baltimore County had one, Harford County had one. So I first started out developing my course syllabus to teach in Baltimore City. So I I'd, I'd, I'd developed it so that I had a group of students in Baltimore City, Harford County, and Towson. I had three sites. And I would teach based to, you know, from one site with the three groups. And what, was, what I tried to do was um, have them work cross site so that they would be doing cooperative learning mm -hmm. and meeting these groups and, and and doing that kind of partnership so that that kind of distance education was how I became involved in doing totally online so when ed leadership department was approached to putting their master's degree online I was like gun ho I was like oh yeah let's do it this will be great by this time I'd retired and was still teaching but I thought I was getting bored you know I was just getting bored with teaching the courses and going in doing the same thing face to face trying to make it a little more energized with cooperative learning bringing in teaching strategies and still trying to model but um, thinking through 
what did you have to do to develop an online program? How, how you have to think through conceptually of having everything work out because once it goes up online, um, you can't say, oh, I think I'll do this tomorrow. I mean, it's there. So um, my course went up first, and um, there, were, you know, there were some technical difficulties with the Blackboard or with whatever program platform we were using. But then as we became more mature and we worked with SEAT and developed this whole program, um, I love it. I find that the quality of work that students do on discussion boards or and relate to the students, um, it's much higher than face to face that I ever achieve, that I've ever received. There, it, um, and I and I think it's because you know, I think it's because if you've been teaching all day and come to campus and spend three hours here, you're tired, mm -hmm. and there's your brain is certainly fatigued. And you know, as a faculty person, you have to do do a number of things to get people stimulated right, and right. work on toe the mark and do do everything. I think when you're online, you can go home, and if you're a night person, you can log on 10 o'clock, whatever time you want to, and complete your work. So it's all based on you as an individual. Online isn't for ed everyone. There are students who forget that they're taking an online course. You know, and very much like they would do face-to-face. -face. Uh -huh. You know, you still have that kind of student that would Oh, I'm an online student. Okay, I have to check in and make sure I've got all the work. There are those students that are very dedicated and will complete the work and do it well. And they'll tell you, oh, you better go check this because it's not working right. I just had, I'm teaching online right now, the internship. And I had a note, by the way, did you know that for case number five, you can't get in. There's an error thing that, that comes up. So you have to fix that and se I send it to Blackboard and say, hey, what do I do now? Uh -huh. um, That's an interesting, you're doing an internship online? Uh-huh. Um, the ed, ed Leadership has integrated the internship program throughout all its courses uh -huh. so that from course one, students yes. have certain activities that they must complete for the internship. And we also have a mentor. I'm also a mentor for the the first cohort I'm I'm teaching now, and they'll be graduating in they'll be graduating in August. Uh -huh. So I've seen them through all their courses. They're getting their MS degree, and I've mentored them to make sure that they've put in their logs, that they've done their program throughout every coursework that they've had. So it's a integrated program mm -hmm. for the internship and I then see. they do case studies and then they complete a stretch project and um, they graduate at the end but they take two courses a semester for the admin one it's a year six um, six credits so then a year they can get their admin one if they want just the 18 right, right. and then for the full masters it's almost two years uh -huh. And they take two courses each semester. I'm now the online coordinator. And with that, I'm working with um, Renee. And we've um, organized that so the students go through as a cohort. Mm -hmm. But let's say Damien decides he's withdrawing mm -hmm. but doesn't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. You have to go back. You know. You, you have to make sure if they drop out, they pick up the courses that right. they need. So right. it's that advising piece mm -hmm. that Renee and I are trying to provide and make sure that students are in the right place and taking the right courses so that they will achieve. And if they drop out, um, I try to send them a note saying, okay, where are you? So this is, is this the handbook prop? No, that's, that's, um, that's the online coordinating, making sure that the students, but now, I'm developing an online handbook and a module because I've found that in my course, if students aren't, if this is their first online course, they don't know how to use our platform Blackboard. Uh -huh. They don't know how, so we've developed a little module that they will go through, write an autobiography, 
and then they'll post it to the Learn Online collection. They'll read an article, answer some, answer some questions, and post their post it on discussion board so that so they'll that do using all the right they're using all the tools of blackboard prior to coming into my course which means i've had to revamp my course mm -hmm. and and they'll understand what to do and how to save their projects in their learn online collection for their portfolio at the end of the development which they'll do in the internship so this is a protocol for the university. <laughs> and um, I, I'm working with Latanya Dyer. And um, she, I'm, I, I, when we first began to work with Siat, it was interesting because she was purely involved in technology, uh -huh. could understand the process uh -huh. of technology, but couldn't understand m where I was coming from with the education background and how I wanted, I didn't want it, my course to be just read, discuss, read, discuss, read, discuss, and then answer the questions. I wanted to integrate cooperative learning, all the different strategies. And so um, we finally got it, finally I'm happy now that I have my students working in groups and of course with wikis and blogs, there's more interaction and there's, it's much more involved and integrate and you know I find I know my students through online I think people feel well I just know their name uh -huh. but if you develop that autobiography and you you keep reading the words you develop a sense of picture and you can do a webinar you can do a WebEx conference you can talk to them I feel I know my students as well as if I was teaching face-to-face -face, because there certainly were face-to-face -face students that were blurs to me. Uh -huh. You know, you always know the ones who's talking, you know the ones who sit there and look at you and yawn, um, but there's a group in the middle that they're there, but you have to, in, you have to involve them. Uh -huh. And so, you know, it's the same way online. You always know the one, you know the ones that are asking you the questions all the time and wanting support. You know, I can tell you three or four names that are the ones that are in my face, face to face. They're the same way online. So I just think it's a, um, it's a way of the future. Um, I hate to tell you, but I just, re I, re I review two courses that are totally online from an, a state and have NK approve, approval. So. I think we need to get with the 21st, 22nd century and use these kinds of opportunities because it meets the needs of students. Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone, but I think more and more, if you look at young people today, what are they, they're on their iPhone all the time. I was at a, a baseball game and this young lady in front of me did not look at the baseball game. She was so busy texting. <laughs> And I'm thinking, and her date paid $50 for this ticket, I think I'd be a little upset. That she was there texting the whole time. So that, you know, they're always on that phone. Right. So how are we going to engage first graders and how are we going to have, that I think is a challenge mm -hmm. because how are teacher, our teacher educators going to deliver their instruction, so we are engaging students in that in this field of technology. That is, to me, the critical point that we're at. Mm -hmm. That juncture: can we keep up with the technology? Right. I don't know. We'll see. One last question, and that's what advice you might give to someone who is considering a career as a teacher. Go for it. I, and that to me, I have been um, blessed. I was fortunate to have wonderful experiences as a beginning teacher. I may have struggled, but I loved my job. I loved my career. I loved going to work every day. I don't know what it would be like to get up in the morning and to know that you have to go someplace that you weren't happy. I, had, I was blessed in that 
I was fortunate to have supervisors who recognized that I could not be hemmed in. I was not a good I was a good I, I, I was a good follower because I did my doctorate, but I was not someone that would always do the same thing every way and I was always allowed to be creative and I was always allowed to think outside the box and I was always challenged. So I was fortunate in that way that I had that opportunity to do what was important and and what would fulfill a need, but I never had to work like doing the same thing all the time. I don't know what it would be like to work in a factory where you had to put, pick out the bottle and do the same thing day in and day out. I was lucky enough to be in a career that I was challenged to be creative. And so I, you know, I think teaching is a wonderful profession. There's so much out there. Unfortunately, teachers today have to be accountable. And in many ways, we were accountable. We were accountable to make sure our children grew. Um, I think the testing accountability has gone way overboard, but I think that's something we should have been more vocal about. And, we, and I think we need leaders who are going to support us. Educators need to be vocal. And educators need to be the ones that are in charge. So, but I would tell anyone, be a teacher. It's a great career, great life. Is there anything that we've forgotten to ask or anything that you would like to add? Didn't ask you that question. Um, my, life, my, my life at Towson has been wonderful. I mean, and I, have, I retired and flunked it and come back and I'm still here. Um, and Seems to be an epidemic in the College of Ed with that retired and somehow wind yeah. up being back here. Um, there's there's that connection, and, and I'm fortunate enough now that um, I have two wonderful lives. I live in Boston, I fly into Baltimore, I stay here for a few days, and then I leave again and come back. <laughs> so it's wonderful. I mean, I have the best of both worlds. And Towson has served me well, and it's I love seeing how it's grown. And we've met the challenges, I think, head on. I think we're being more creative. So, good luck, and thank you for asking me to share my life. Thank you for doing it. It's a pleasure. <laughs>